¿Qué hay de nuevo, Watch Fam? Yo soy Rolly y tú eres Christian. Yeah, Theo and Harris. What is up, guys? Uh, welcome to Liquor Run. Uh, we're looking to have, have a little bit of fun here um, with a, with a new bottle of wine by who? Uh, this is a Blau Frankish from uh, Marcus Altenberger. 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 All right, before we begin, a quick wristwatch check. I already know what you have on your wrist, and I love that watch. Uh, two days straight, the the Cartier. Isn't that uh, beautiful? I watch? love this watch. Oh my I god! I don't wear it enough. But, I uh, should wear it a little bit more. But it's beautiful. It is a beautiful watch. That was it, your Christmas gift from mom. Yeah, such a light watch. It sits perfectly well. I, so I knew my my dad always had a passion for for you know Cartier watches. Not that he's so adverse to wearing small watches, but. I had a Cartier before, and, and I knew that he enjoyed it, but still felt that it was a little bit, you know, uh, a little bit small on his wrist. So when I found this watch, which is actually unnamed, there is no model name for it, which had the step bezel and a larger, much, much larger case, I said, whoa, that's perfect for you, because uh, it has all of that classic Cartier, you know, the funk and style and, and, and just you know, classic elements, uh, but with a more, you know, modern approachable size for someone like you. Yeah, it's cool. So, uh, yeah, it's, that's kind really of the explanation. oversized, rectangular. Definitely. I love face. it. Face, yeah. Yeah, cool. I'm wearing uh, another gold watch. I'm wearing mm -hmm. a Rolex Datejust with a beautiful gilt dial and a presidential bracelet. So, I, uh, I went with a little bit less of a uh, understated, elegant look today. I went with a little bit of a, you know, a little bit of a, you know, Wolf of Wall Street kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, that's it. Okay, so, um, let's, let's introduce our topics and then we'll introduce our wine so tell me about the the wine world tell me about the issues right now what what is like the what's the dark cloud yeah the the dark cloud in the wine world in 2017 natural disasters you had fires in california right we all know about we had massive fires in chile earlier in the year we had massive frost all across france italy um to the point that they're reporting uh that the harvest for 2017 probably is the smallest it's been in over 50 years, over five decades. Jesus Christ! It's gonna have a, a it's gonna have a huge impact on wine from next year and the year after, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, so I think some some areas will, will may struggle. Champagne, Champagne was was hit really really hard. Mm -hmm. Burgundy, uh, Bordeaux, etc. Uh, Italy as well. Northern Italy was rocked with frost. And then, of course, we know what happened in Napa. Napa you know, sure. it just <clears throat> massive devastation. And we can't, and we have to mention Chile too. Yeah. That's that's crazy. I mean, as someone that you know just kind of consumes wine, you know, mm -hmm. like I do, and you know, with you, uh, I you know, I'm not in the loop there. So you know, although yes, I definitely know about the, you know, forest fires or the the, the fires in California. It's just not my the first place I go to is not what happens to the wine world, but I, I'm sure it was massively affected in the watch world. Uh, we've got a very interesting kind of climate. So for the past few years, uh, there have been official reports of a decreasing mm -hmm. uh, or um, large, large drops in exports of Swiss watches. Okay, So the manufacturers were sending fewer watches to Asia. They were sending fewer watches to America and to all these different mm -hmm. markets. Right. So that was obviously uh, a big, big exclamation point red flag. Right. Uh, why they were sending fewer it's kind of foggy, right? Is it only reflective of, of, of poor sales in those markets, or is it reflective of the poor sales combined with these these boutiques saying, literally stop it, like stop sending us the stuff? I mean, were these boutiques ever getting an appropriate amount of stock? Or were they always being overflowed and it was mm -hmm. finally just coming to a head where they said, whoa, what well, these boutiques may have just said over the course of the last couple of years, we have to fix this, this is a disaster. You know, your your overflow is, is forcing us to sell on the gray market, you know, and uh, and it's, it's causing a disaster in the industry. Now, most recently, there have been upticks mm -hmm. in exports, mm -hmm. but that makes us think, okay, are those upticks representative or reflective of increase in sales, mm -hmm. retail, or is it just these manufacturers saying again, yep, let's push them to the limit? Because we don't know. You know, exports don't equal sales. No, of course. You know, no. so that's a scary, yeah, scary sure. thought. You sure. know, what does that uptick mean? Is that really reflective of the health of the retail market? Is it demand? Or exactly. is it just an artificial Exactly, push? right. 
let's crack open this bottle of wine and let's get into the future of the industries a little bit more after that. I think, you know, you talk about, you know, artificial uh, creating a market and, yeah. and, and, and manipulating a market. That also applies in the wine world too. Uh, for sure. but, but, you know, maybe that's a topic for another day. Um, we're going to drink an Austrian wine, yeah. an Austrian red wine. We don't know, normally uh, see that very often. Screw cap. It's a screw cap. What do they say about screw caps? <laughs> what did, uh, who was it? It was <laughs> Eric Repair. Yeah, Eric Repair. Eric Repair. Uh, Tony Bourdain <laughs> asked Eric Repair, uh, you know, uh, what do you think about screw caps? You know, and Eric Repair is like a super gentlemanly kind of guy, you know, big restaurateur. Uh, and he said, you know, okay, without so. saying too much, I think that you are less likely to get laid after you open up a screw cap bottle of wine than you are if you go the full, you know, classic route. So, uh, you know, good thing I'm not trying to lay you. So right. now we can, we can just drink with our screw cap. Uh, uh, beautiful berry uh, nose. You, again, you just sipped it without even... Salud. I yeah, think. No, it's a little late now. Mmm. Mmm. Wow, you didn't, wow. Even, you didn't even insist. Hey, so, you know. Salute. Yeah, nope. Okay, not gonna twist your arm. What do you think? I didn't taste it yet. Well, you should. So I'll, I'll give it a shot. Hey, give it a shot. You never know. I taste a lot. Sure, but you're missing something. Totally. Yeah. Um, this is really nice. This tastes a little bit like Pinot Noir to me. Know. Yeah. Yeah. I'm do you do you find you're, yeah you're you're a little off. To me, it's almost like, you know because of that lack of mm -hmm. it, yeah. It you're almost, it's almost a little bit watery. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Is it not? Oh god, I'm so embarrassed. Yeah, this has like a real like a Pinot Noirish quality to it, and I don't know, a, a blau blau Frankish. I mean, <laughs> maybe, I don't know anything about this grape, so I, I, this one I'm, I'm going blind on this. Uh, and maybe I should have done more more research on it. But I was I'm I'm always intrigued by red wines that are that are that are made that are produced in in northern reaching countries or northern reaching geographies territories yeah because it's harder for these grapes to 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 ripen does that interest you it does yeah i mean I, I love you know that's why you see predominantly white white wine coming out of you know uh i guess austria and and you know germany mm -hmm. but but this is a great example of of a, of a really nice wine that that red wine that's coming out of uh austria yeah i i actually do like it i mean once again i'm not getting much out of it but mm -hmm. but uh i do like what i do get yeah I want to try this one again when I'm not, you know, taking Advil Colon. Has nice fruit. It has really nice acidity. It's my, it, this is in my wheelhouse. I, I love this old world style where you have the fruit, but it's really balanced with good, good acid. Okay. Um, and it, it's not overly tannic at, at all. It's a very medium bodied wine. In fact, maybe even closer to to, uh, to light. But I, I'll I'll stand by medium. Yeah, definitely yeah. medium. I mean, you yeah. The color, yeah. You know? yeah. But it's airing on the light side though. You it definitely. Color. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, really great, great fruit. Salud. Let's get back into our conversation. Salud. Let's, so, let's chat. Uh, so how do you think, okay, mm -hmm. so you, you've made it clear that there have been, you know, natural problems in the wine world, right? Fires and, and frosts and things like that. Yeah. Histor I guess taking into account, like, you know, this isn't the first time this stuff has happened. How does the wine world deal with this? Is it is it an increase in price? Is it is it lack of availability? I mean, do we live in an area that availability doesn't really matter because we live in a high consumer area? Like, what do you think as a consumer is go how are you going to be affected by this by this natural problem? I I think it'll will will have a better sense uh I guess the harvest just finished uh in, in this year. We'll get reports now from from in 2018 about the body, you know, stuff that's in barrel. Okay. So we'll know, we'll have a better sense of, of, of how much juice right. was was had, how much is vinified, you know, and uh, so we'll, we'll begin to see reports probably starting in the spring. But now, uh, and now what's going on? And, pr and price will go, to answer your question, pri I suspect price is gonna go up. But now we'll, once again, I don't know how the whole yeah. wine importation, mm -hmm. wine distribution works, but will prices go up when that wine hits the shelves? Or will prices go up, you know, preemptively to cushion that pain? Like, could prices go up next week from certain manufacturers because they know they're it, gonna have a shitty year? It'll go up marginally in the everyday wine. I think it's gonna spike up a lot in in areas and prize properties gotcha. where th there may, there may have been some damage to some prize, uh, you know, plots of land. Interesting. Then then you're gonna see a massive spike. It's gonna be very little juice. And if the harvest or the the year was great, was really really good. Now you get it's a double whammy. Really great wine, very low quantity. It's going to be Skyrim. probably unreachable. Wow. For for the top for the top estate wines, you know. Interesting stuff. Yeah. Uh, in the watch world. Yeah. Um, 
my personal opinion uh, is that nothing has gotten better on the retail end. Mm -hmm. That's my my guess. Uh, why do I say that? Uh, simply, very anecdotally, because I don't think that the watch companies um, have done anything very remarkable to change consumer, uh, well, to, to change how people shop. And I think that yes, they are present on social media. So on retail and social media to me are my two the two biggest things. Online retail and social media. And while those those two boxes are being checked to some degree, they're not being checked. Uh, as they should be by multi-billion dollar companies. Um, you know, Omega is, in my opinion, not communicating in a way that Omega should be. You see my point? Yeah. Uh, they're, they're too big, their bar is too high, you know, because their budgets are so great and they're, you know, they have such wonderful uh, material to market with. To me, it's just like, uh, uh, unimpressive what they do on a daily basis for marketing. So, uh, because I don't think that these big brands have changed the way that they work. So you're saying that they're they're slow to react to how consumers are uh, ingesting, way digesting, slow. not even close, and, and, right? And and uh, so not that's having a, a direct impact on demand. Are they losing customers so he, or are they not gaining customers? So here, here's how I think it is. Um, there, in, the, in the watch retail market, there are two there are two uh, uh, lines here. One is the is the in store retail experience. Second is the gray market. Mm -hmm. Okay, gray market dealers sound like they're the guys in the in, with their jackets and they're like, oh, yeah. I want to buy a watch. Right. Not true at all. If you know a gray market dealer, you know these these people are you know many of them that I know. They're like super reputable. You know, these are not these are not like sketchy guys. Mm -hmm. These are you know serious. Like you know, not to sound shallow, but really, really, really successful people, and they they, they have their sales pitch, and the sales pitch works because you know it from all of the people that you know that have worked with them, and the the businesses they built are so enormous. So, uh, it's not a matter of lack of reliability on the gray market end. So now the only thing that the gray market's missing from from the from the retail market is saying, okay, I'm actually Omega. Right. right now, Omega on that retail end really could open up that gap massively if they communicated with consumers better, mm -hmm. but they haven't. Walking into an Omega boutique is very much so like walking into a great dealer's office. Yes. Walking into a great dealer's, you know, 64th Street apartment and having a scotch mm -hmm. is honestly probably more enjoyable, you know, than, than you know, walking into an Omega boutique and, and being pestered, you know, it's probably more enjoyable. So the consumer experience and interaction that Omega could have at scale, considering their budget and considering everything is garbage. So they've given a wonderful opportunity for great dealers to offer way lower prices. That's what they do. And their experience is not maybe equal, but pretty damn good. You know, if the great dealer, if the great market dealer can save you twenty percent, and the experience is pretty damn good, why not just go to him? Right. The, the, so it's, it sounds like the the uh, the problem in the watch world is more so marketing, and customer outreach, and customer acquisition, yeah. whereas the problem, you know, in in the wine world that we're facing today is more of supply. Right. You know, and and you alluded earlier to a supply, but that may be just an artificial supply, or actually now flooding right. to make things look better than they really are. Which so, I, which so, is what I think which is is, so, so you're flooding the retail market. So you've got that issue, and then you've got this whole gray market issue that I'm learning about that I, yeah. I didn't really know much about. The, a consumer can go just to the gray market, get their watch, maybe For, at, at a significant at discount, a significant 20, discount 30 right? Percent. Right, so they're Whereas hurting. Omega you, will only offer you ten, and you're hurting. You're hurting yourself. Uh, you're hurting your brand. Yeah. So, yeah. and now these gray market, you know, uh, dealers are becoming such reputable businesses. You know, I mean, they're offering payment plans the same way as the you know, same way as dealers are authorized to. You know, right? Uh, it's incredible. Uh, it's it's incredible. So it's it's hard for an educated consumer, a consumer that knows about the gray market, to say, yeah, I'm gonna pony up at Omega. Right. I'm gonna go to Omega and spend right. six thousand when I can go to a great dealer and spend right. you know forty eight. Right. It's a huge difference. Right. It's a it's a totally different yeah. level of watch. Yeah. yeah. You know. So uh, so yeah, I think the watch industry's in a lot of trouble, man. Yeah, you know, it, it reminds me years ago, um, back in the '80s, uh, uh, there was a I, well, and maybe it still exists today, but on the high end audio, uh, 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 you know, market. Yeah. There was definitely a, a gray market where you could buy. Nakamichi, you yeah. know NAD, and you could buy it a great, great market, yeah. save significant, significant money, discounts. and they were reputable dealers. They yeah. just weren't authorized dealers. Yeah. Uh, so that what you're explaining to me 
does remind me of that. Yeah. Not that I ever, you know, I, I, I was never, I never did it, but I know friends of mine had absolutely bought sure. stuff from, from places like that in Manhattan. Yeah. All you're so. foregoing is one, the trust that, you know, if I, if, I don't know what the brand is, Nakamaki. Or, and Nakamichi. Nakamichi. Yeah. And, you know, if I trust the person who's selling it to me, I trust that they're not selling me a fake or not mm-hmm. selling me a, a, you know, a, a scam. It's still the product. Yeah. It's still the high, you know the, the yeah. higher quality product. Right. You're not cheaping out. You're just going the yeah. more cost. You know, you're right. just going the more intelligent kind of way in, mm-hmm. in many respects. Mm-hmm. You know, you're not buying it out of the van of somebody at you right. know, it's at, at wherever. You know, but that's it. So what do we do with you this? Know, what, what's the conundrum? Well, we do nothing. We just yeah. we just comment. We just yeah. drink wine and comment. But uh, I'm glad that we had the conversation. I mean, obviously, both industries in different ways have their problems, and uh, I very much so look forward uh, to talking about the handling of these problems in retrospect because we'll drink more wine and discuss it then. Or because of what happened this year, we may be doing liquor on I mean, once every four weeks because it's so expensive. It's so expensive. <laughs> Cheers, Daddy. Cheers. Thank you for bringing me this bottle Salute. of wine. It's yeah. actually quite good, even though I. It's do. very good. I'll taste yeah. it in the morning. I'll have it for yeah. breakfast. Marcus Altenberg, Blaufrankisch. 